to be here this evening, evening and a big, and a big welcome, welcome to everyone watching, watching on, on YouTube. Awesome. Praise God. So tonight, I'm just trying to get myself untangled from the microphone. Blah, 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 blah. There we go. Um, I want to share with you tonight five lessons that I've learned from knowing Andrew Womack and being close to his ministry. Um, I've taught like this a couple of times before. I had the, the joy and honor of preaching at Dave Duell's church a few years ago, um, just after he passed away, and I shared five lessons I'd, I'd learned from Dave Duell at his own church. That was a powerful meeting. <coughs> But Andrew's coming on Sunday. I'll let you know uh, the five lessons I've learned. I first heard Andrew in 1998. Now, to set the context of me hearing Andrew in 1998, I'd first heard Kenneth Copeland in 1997. And when Kenneth Copeland came to the UK in 1997, he came to Birmingham in England. Not Birmingham, Alabama, where we've just been, but Birmingham in England. And um, I was told not to go and hear Kenneth Copeland. That's what they told me. They said, don't go and hear him. The Baptists told me not to go. The Pentecostals told me he was dangerous. They said, don't go. And I was just young enough in 98 to really be, if you tell me not to do something, there's still a little bit that says, I'm going to do that because you told me not to. And so I went to um, the indoor arena to hear Kenneth Copeland. But I had my notebook with me and I had my pen. I was ready. I was going to take notes on everything he said. I was going to line up with scripture. I was going to make sure it was scripture. I was going to be there. It was all going to be fine. And I found out two things that evening. Number one, Kenneth Colton preaches for a long time. It was a two and a half hour message. I took a lot of notes. And uh, secondly, everything he said was based on scripture. And he taught on righteousness. He taught on how we're right with God. And we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Um, interestingly enough, Amanda was watching a 10-year-old program today, an interview with Jamie Womack. And she said the greatest revelation she ever had in her life was listening to Kenneth Copeland teach on the righteousness of God. And I certainly had those great revelations in 97. And so I'm finding out from the scriptures that, you know, he was made sin so I could be made righteous. And I'm the righteousness of God and I'm right with God. And therefore, being made right with God, I have peace with God. I'm justified, just if I've never sinned. And this revelation gets me. I walk out that meeting about 10 foot tall. I'm ready to change the world. And then I discovered as I started to live my life, I was married to Amanda. We had two, uh, no, just one little child at the time. Uh, Amanda was pregnant with Joel at the time. We had no money coming in. I was at Bible college. Things were tough. And I found out I'm not righteous. Sometimes I'm not even nice. Not even kind. Not even halfway there. And so I'd go back to the scriptures. I'm the righteousness of God. I'm the righteousness of God. i go, I'm not though. And eventually after several weeks of this sort of um, double standard and double mindedness, I got very confused. And so I gave up on that whole teaching and really just ditched it. And it helped a little bit, some of the stuff I'd heard. Uh, we were seeing a little bit more healings than what we'd seen. We saw someone get out of a wheelchair and start walking. We'd seen some miracles, but really nothing uh, really consistent. And there certainly wasn't a consistency in myself. And then we went to this conference in 98. I didn't go to hear Andrew Womack. I didn't know who he was. He wasn't even on TV in 1998. I didn't start his TV ministry until 2001. And uh, I went to hear Ray Bevan, who was uh, my favorite preacher in the UK at the time. And I also went to hear John Avanzini, because I knew he was going to talk about money, and we had no money. I mean, we were broke beyond broke. We were praying in tongues to have fruit. I mean, it was just crazy. We were just in such a poor place. And so we get there, and we find out Ray Bevan's not speaking until Friday night. John Avanzini's not speaking until Saturday. It's Monday night coming up, first night of the conference. And uh, we were staying in someone's house. We had nowhere to stay. Couldn't afford a hotel. Um, <laughs> We didn't even have the money to get home. We literally bought our train tickets and didn't have the money to get home. We were stuck at this conference. That's, you know, we just knew we had to be there. I thought something's going to happen with John Avanzini at some point this week. Um, but the conference was Andrew Womack and Dave Duell, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, until Ray turned up Sunday, Friday night. I'm like, this conference is going to be terrible. Who's this Andrew Womack and Dave Duell? I said to Amanda, I hope they're good. I really hope they're good, but I'm probably going to be disappointed. So the first night, Andrew Womack gets up to speak, and he says this. He says, I want to speak to those people today who can read in the Bible that they're righteous and can read in the Bible that they're blessed and can read in the Bible that they're healed, but they look at their life and they go, but I'm not righteous and I'm not blessed and I'm not healed. He says, I'm going to help this make sense to you tonight. And I'm like, I'm listening. You got my attention. Absolutely had my attention. And so the first thing I learned from him that very first night was this, and it never made sense to me until then, but it made perfect sense by the end of his message. My spirit is not my soul. My spirit is not my soul. I'm not a two-part being, a soul and a body. I'm a three-part being. I'm spirit, soul, and body. And that's an essential revelation. First Thessalonians 5.23 says that the God of peace would sanctify us holy, spirit, soul, and body. A lot of Christians say body, soul, and spirit. That's a reflection of the way that their carnal life, not a reflection of the Word of God. 
But the word of God says spirit, soul, body. Genesis 2 verse 7 says that God crafted man out of the dust of the earth, made him out of mud, made him out of stuff, made him out of physical stuff. So he had a physical body that can interact with this world. Your body is how you interact with this world. If I want to pick up this Bible, I need to use my body. I can't pick up by the power of the soul. I'm not a Jedi. Can't do it. Okay. So you can see your body. Everyone with me? You can feel your body. Okay. But how many of you know you can't see your soul? But you can feel your soul. I'm having a bad day today. Things are just getting on top of me. I can feel it. I can feel it. You know, I can touch you soul to soul without ever physically touching you. I can say words that make you happy, make you mad, whatever. You can go and watch a play or watch a film. They can make you have feelings. So your soul has feelings. It's where you have your feelings, where you make decisions. But there's another part of you called the spirit. And that's the part of you that is breathed by God. It said God spirited into man the spirit of life. The Hebrew is ruach. He breathed into man the breath of life. Same word, breath and spirit. You could equally say he spirited into man the spirit of life. And now man's got a living spirit inside him. So man, and then man became, first man became a living soul. So he's spirit, soul, and body. And when you get born again, I'm not going to go through the whole plan of redemption with you. I've got stuff on YouTube going through all of that. But your spirit is saved instantly. The second you believe, as soon as you believe in the name of the Lord, as soon as you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross of your sins, he rose again the third day, as soon as you declare your mouth, he's Lord, you're saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10. You're saved. And if you're saved, guess what? Instant. Your spirit is instantly saved. Your spirit is now just as perfect as Jesus. That's how scriptures like just as he is, so are we in the world make sense. That's how I'm the righteousness of God makes sense. My spirit is perfectly righteous. My spirit is one spirit with Jesus. My spirit looks just like him. If you could bring an x-ray machine into this room today and put it right there, and Jesus walks into the room. If Jesus stands next to me, you could all tell me apart from Jesus because my body doesn't look like him. Now, if you could get that x-ray machine, you could play buttons with it, and you could look at his soul and my soul, guess what? They're different. I'm still in the process of having my mind renewed. Do you know Jeremiah says that every thought he has for you is good, never has a thought to harm you? Sometimes I think of harming people. Sometimes I think some people need a high five in the face you know sometimes I just have a thought Jesus never has those thoughts so you can look at his soul his thoughts his feelings he never has an up day and down day he's always just Jesus he's consistent you know he doesn't say he doesn't suffer doesn't say he hasn't gone through stuff but he didn't let it into his soul so our souls look very different but if you could turn that x-ray machine to spirit you couldn't tell the difference my mom couldn't tell the difference his mom couldn't tell the difference nobody can tell the difference between me and jesus in the spirit realm and until i understood my spirit's not my soul so much of this didn't make sense to me but getting that revelation in 98 things started to make sense to me righteousness had never made sense to me i knew that kenneth Copeland told me i was righteous i believed it i received it i named it i claimed it but I didn't appreciate it or understand it until Andrew Womack turned up and said, my spirit is not my soul. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, the word of God can divide spirit and soul. So if they can be divided, they're different. But you can't divide them without the word. You cannot divide them without the word because you can't feel your spirit. So how can I know what my spirit's like until I get the word? But when I get the word, I can look at my spirit and go, my spirit's perfect and pure and holy and blessed and highly favored. And then I go, my soul needs to catch up a little bit. <laughs> Because I can feel my soul. And sometimes I don't feel highly favored. Sometimes I don't feel righteous. Sometimes I don't feel very healed. And on those days, guess what I do? I separate my spirit and soul with the word and go, I'm going to live by the spirit. That's how I'm going to live. And so I'm so glad for that revelation. So your spirit's saved instantly. But guess what? Your soul can be saved gradually. You can change the way you think. You can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. James says that if we humbly receive the word of God, James 1.21, then our soul will be saved. It's not talking about getting born again. I know all the evangelists say, oh, we saw a thousand souls saved. They're, they saw a thousand spirits saved. If they don't be technically correct. You know, they're not going to see a thousand souls saved. Takes, taking your, getting your soul saved takes forever. It's a long process. And so that's the first thing I learned, and that was life-changing. I'm so glad I learned that. I'm so glad I know that. I'm so glad I know my spirit's not my soul. I knew my soul wasn't my body. No one else taught me that. Andrew Womack told me that in a conference in 1998 in Stafford. Changed my life forever. And now I know how to live out of the Spirit. Now I know I don't need to pray, Oh God, I need more love. Because I know all the love in the world is loaded in my Spirit. Oh, bless me, Father. I don't say bless me, Father. I say bless the Lord, oh my soul. I've been teaching on worship in our Suffolk church recently. And David doesn't go, bless my soul, oh God. He says, bless the Lord, oh my soul. So who's speaking to his soul? 
the spirit. His spirit is saying, hey, soul, you're going to get with the blessing program. Get yourself up off the ground. Start worshiping God. Lift up your hands. Start praising the Lord. And start thanking him for the good things he's done for you. Because sometimes, how many of you know, your soul can just have a little bit of a tantrum. There's another psalm that says, why are you so downcast within me, soul? You know, sometimes you've got to look at yourself and speak to yourself from your spirit and say, why are you having a bad day, for goodness sakes? Do you know you're not going to hell? Do you know you're never going to hell? You're going to go to heaven when you die. It's awesome. Man, you should be having a bad day. Why are you so downcast within me, soul? Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And grab hold of yourself and start sorting yourself out. But you can't do any of that if you don't realize my spirit is not my soul. Because you wake up and you don't feel very blessed. Well, I'm not blessed. I don't feel it. No, your soul doesn't feel very blessed, but your spirit is blessed and highly favored. Now I'm going to live out my spirit, not my soul. So there's so much comes out when you understand that your spirit is not your soul. It's so important we understand that we are a free part being. It's so urgent. That was the very first lesson Andrew taught that very first day. And he came out of the pulpit. There was two and a half thousand people in that room. And by then, our second son had been born. Our man had given birth. And Joel was six weeks old. And Adam was, uh, he was four days off his second birthday that Monday night. He had his second birthday at that conference. And so we took him in. And some of you have got kids, I know. And there he was. First time in his life he'd ever been in a room that big with so many people. And he just went hyper excited, man. And so Andrew finished preaching. Amanda gets up and goes to the bathroom. And I've got this runaround kid and the, the other one's screaming. Joel's like six weeks old screaming. So I've got Joel in my arms screaming. I'm trying to grab Adam and pick him up. I've got him by the back of the dungarees. So I've got one in this. And I can't put either of them in the buggy because, I mean, you can't just sling them in. They don't like it when you do that. And I, but I haven't got two hands to carefully put one of them in. So I'm just kind of like this, trying to wriggle this one into it or maybe wriggle this one into the... And we had the, one of those double push chairs. And so this guy walks up to me, he goes, you look like you need some help. I was like, yeah, I do. And I basically passed him one of my kids. I can't remember which one I passed him. And he helped me get the bush wrapped in. And you see, I have this thing where I don't recognize people if they're not where I expect them to be. Like if you came to Dagenham next, like in a few weeks' time on a Sunday morning, and you, hey, Ben, how you doing? I mean, I know you, I recognize you, I recognize you, I know you. But if you came to Dagenham rather than Guildford, and you come, hey, Ben, how you doing? Mm. it really does throw me if people aren't in the right place I once stopped Andrew Ormack bear in mind I watch him every day on TV pretty much and I was going to pick up Dwayne Sheriff and meet Dwayne and take Dwayne somewhere we're going to go out with Dwayne and so he told me he was in a cafe in London having lunch with someone and I could pick him up at that cafe so I drive into London back in the old days when you could drive into London and I'm there and I can't find the cafe. And he told me the name of it, and I can't find it. So I get out of my car, and there's a man walking. Excuse me, sir. Could you just give me directions to such and such a cafe? And it was Andrew Womack. And I, I'm, I'm looking at him right like that. He's standing right there. And until he opens his mouth, as soon as he starts to speak, I realized who it was. As soon as I, but I didn't recognize it because I didn't expect his face to be. I didn't know Dwayne's lunch was with Andrew. I didn't know that. And so as soon as he opens his mouth, I'm like, are you Andrew? This is before we knew each other. Are you Andrew? He goes, yeah. He goes, who are you? And back then, he had two names for me. He either called me the pastor who really looks after Dwayne. That was the name I preferred. Because Dwayne used to always sing our praises and say we really looked after him. And he said, oh, he used to call me the Playboy's pastor. Because he, he knew Richard. And I was like, I know Richard's watching online, bless him. So he said, oh, you're the Playboy's past. You're the guy who really looks after Dwayne. I was like, I'm actually not looking for the cafe. I'm looking for Dwayne. He pointed out Dwayne was just standing over there looking for me. We'd got on the wrong side of the road of each other. Um, but I'm like that. And so the fact I'd heard this guy preach once. I don't know who he was. And my background was um, a bit of Pentecostal, a bit of word of faith. There's no way a preacher after a conference of 2,500 people is going to be there helping you put your kid back in the buggy. There's no way. It's not happening. And he's there and he's doing it. And... Um, I said, that was a great message today. That really helped me understand some things I've been trying to work out for a while. Had exactly the same conversation with him in America about a month ago. That message helped me put some things in place I'm still trying to work out. Um, but then Amanda comes back from the ladies. The babies are both fine. Andrew's pushing our buggy, rocking the babies. And she said, I didn't understand some of the stuff you said today. 
And uh, she hadn't listened to all the tapes I'd listened to on Righteousness by Kenneth Copeland trying to get my head around it. So he takes over to the, ta- the tape stall. I'm like, you don't understand. We don't even have the money to get home. There's no way we're going to be able to buy tapes today. I thought, cheeky man, making a little sale. He gave us tapes. I mean, he gave us so many tapes. He just gave us tapes here. This will really help, and this will help, and this is the stuff you need to listen to. He gave us a place called There, man. You need that when you're at Bible College. And we're just like, man, this is so good. What do you want? No, I want you to have these. And he said, that's my ministry's number. Phone them up, and I'm going to tell them to send you more stuff. Man, I said to Amanda, I don't just want to teach like that. I want to be like that. That's the kind of minister I want to be. I'm the guy just loading people with tapes and helping people and doing what I can to bless people. But that revelation, that's the first thing I learned. My spirit is not my soul. And so, awesome. So, his ministry gave me loads and loads of free tapes. At the end, at the end of my um, first term of Bible college, I had over 150 Andrew Mac tapes. And I'd listened to every single one of them at least 10 times. I just listened and listened and listened and listened. And my favorite series at that moment, this is going back to 99 now, end of 98, beginning of 99, my favorite series was about hardness of heart. That's one of the earliest series. And uh, the hardness of heart book at the time was five pounds. That's how much it cost in the 20th century to buy hardness of heart, five pounds. And I had to save up about five months to get five pounds. I'm not exaggerating, we were that poor. And I managed to order that book and finally it came. Man, that book on hardness of heart, it just nailed me. It just absolutely got me. We need a soft heart. And if you read that book, what it basically says is to get a soft heart, once you get a soft heart, miracles should be normal. Just have a look at Mark 6 for a second. Have a look at Mark 6. I just went back to this book, actually, just a few months ago. and I hadn't read it for quite a while. And I didn't realize until I picked up again, it was the very first book Andrew ever wrote. And so it looks like it's one of the earliest revelations you ever had. And I think it's the one that sort of is the master key to getting more revelations. When you have a soft heart, God can show you other stuff. And so if you look at this, let's look at Mark 6. Let's start at verse 45. I mean, I, this is a midweek crowd. I'm assuming you all know your Bibles. You know, this is Jesus walking on the water. That book starts out, by the way, pointing out that the feeding of 5,000 and the walking on water is the same day. That's how Andrew starts the book. And he says this in the first page, I think, it's either the first or second page of that book. He says, obviously, it's like, yes, obviously, yes, obviously, yes, obviously, um, walking on water is a greater miracle than feeding 5,000. And Andrew just states it like that, like, it's, yeah, of course, everyone knows that. Rank these miracles in order of difficulty. And Andrew says, and I, I'm, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not a fool. If Andrew says it, I believe it. <laughs> You know, unless I've got something in the scripture shows me totally otherwise, I'm going to believe what Andrew says. So I said, Lord, why is that a harder miracle? Why is walking on water a harder miracle than feeding the 5,000? And he said, just imagine yourself right now feeding 5,000 people. And I can pretty much imagine myself doing that. It's a lot harder to imagine yourself walking on water. It is. It messes your imagination more. You, you've had a lifetime of knowing that you sink when you go in water. <laughs> And so especially if you're a fisherman, especially if you live all the time, you know. And so I realized that what he was talking about was if you have a soft heart, the, 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 the subtitle of that book is um, hard, it's about imagination. Subtitle, a lot of Andrew's books are about imagination. He finally came out and wrote a book on imagination a couple of years ago. But don't limit God. Harness your imagination. It's all about imagination. And so when you realize that, miracles should be normal. So here we are. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat, same day as the feeding of the 5,000, and going ahead to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dispersed the crowd. After saying goodbye to them, he went to the mountain to pray. When the evening was come, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. He saw them straining at the oars because the wind was against them, and the night was ending. He came to them walking on the sea, for he wanted to pass by them. When they saw him walking on the water, they thought he was a ghost. Can you imagine? That's their first thought. Jesus is dead. And now his ghost has come to haunt us. I don't know where they got that from in the Old Testament. I don't know where on earth they thought that was a possibility. I mean, they got so scared and so panicking and so thought on death and so obsessed with death and so thinking about their own death, they all became pagans. They were raised Jewish. And they're now all pagan. They're terrified. And they cried out, it's a ghost. Oh my goodness, Jesus come to haunt us. How can that be your first thought? And they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them, Have courage, it's I. Do not be afraid. Then he went with them into the boat. The wind ceased. They were completely astonished. But they did not. They were completely astonished because 
Why? Because they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Jesus walked on water. Jesus stopped the storm. And the disciples, rather than going, thank you, went, I can't believe that just happened. I, I, I really don't believe that's what just happened. We, we have to realize that miracles should be common. You pray for the sick and they don't get healed. That should be the surprise. But why is it we have these problems? You know, we have to reach a point where our hearts are so soft that miracles are common. That there's, you, you all know there's a spirit realm and a natural realm. You all know in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the problem is, is that we're so tied to this natural realm, we're so bound by the rules of it, we forget there's a higher realm. There's a realm that doesn't care about the laws on this realm. It can feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. It can turn water into wine. It can get someone out of a wheelchair and dancing and clapping and praising God. It can open blind eyes and it can open deaf ears and it can make the lame walk. There's a power that's totally unlimited, but in our carnality, we perceive that as strange. Oh, something showed up today. Miracles should be normal when our heart's soft enough to the spiritual realm. I was teaching at the Karis Bible College in Zimbabwe before lockdown, and I was teaching on special miracles, Acts 19, special miracles. And I said, for that phrase to exist, there had to be normal miracles. No one's going to use the phrase special miracle unless miracles are commonplace. And Paul was seeing so many miracles, and what's a special miracle? Oh, this miracle was special. Paul didn't even have to touch the person. We saw somebody in South Africa healed through a prayer cloth, blind. Just a few years ago, I taught on prayer cloths. I gave out some prayer cloths at the end of the service. Somebody posted one to a family member in South Africa. She was totally blind. She was totally healed. That's a special miracle. That's not normal. But I want to get to the place where we see normal miracles all the time. And as I was preaching in Zimbabwe on special miracles, I started having some words of knowledge and prophetic words for people in the Bible college. And I walked up to a lady... And I said it so strongly. I said, you are not an illusion. That's what I said. I thought that was a strange thing to say. You are not an illusion. And God is not disillusioned with you. And as I said it, she fell onto the ground, started sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. And I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what happened. God didn't tell me the story. And at the end of that, you know, gave about 15 minutes it was easily. And I was praying for some other people. She got back up and God gave me another word for her. And she fell down and started sobbing again. So at the end of the meeting, I said, I'd love to hear what's going on. And uh, this lady, she, she, she started Bible college as a virgin. I'm just being aware of the children in the room. But she was assaulted by a number of men. And uh, tragic, tragic situation. And uh, she decided that that meant she was no good for ministry. She was no good to be a minister. She couldn't be in the fivefold ministry. She couldn't pastor. And uh, she told her friend the night before, and the friend was sitting right next to her in the Bible college. She said, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to take my own life at the end of this week because my life is just an illusion. Everything about me is an illusion. It's all an illusion. It's all fake. There's nothing real anymore. It's all gone. And I can't do what God's called me to do. And God said exactly the words that she said the night before to bring her to that place. I told that story in our own church a few years ago. And a lady started crying. And I said, what's going on? She goes, I heard her preach. She said, I've heard that testimony because I heard her preach in Zimbabwe. She said, I was in Zimbabwe and she preached in one of the churches I was at. And she preached and told me the whole story. I didn't know it was my own pastor. I think it's time for some special miracles. But we need to soften our heart. We need to do what? How do we soften our heart? We'll just skip forward to Mark 8. Let's look at this. Because if you keep your heart hardened, you end up stupid. You know? Second plague was a plague of frogs. Plague of frogs. Frogs everywhere. It said bakers couldn't bake a loaf of bread without a frog getting into the bread mixture and having frogs in their bread. That's what it says in the Bible. It says there was frogs in the bed at night. Guy leaning over to kiss his wife goodnight before bed. Kiss the big frog. I mean, they said there was frogs in the ovens. They're trying to make dinner and frogs were in the ovens. Frogs were in the bread. Frogs were in the beds. Frogs are everywhere. And it says Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart to the Lord. And Moses says, Pharaoh, 
God's told me when I, as soon as I pray, all the frogs will disappear. As soon as I pray, every frog will just go. And Pharaoh says, pray tomorrow. <laughs> what? Pray right now? Get rid of the frogs right now. No, I want, I want the frogs in my bed one last night. <laughs> There is something seriously wrong. And people do stupid things because their hearts are hard to God. So we have to get this right. Um, so let's jump into this. Let's jump into verse 14. This is the same day as the feeding of the 4,000. So we've seen another miracle multiplication just two chapters later. Now they'd forgotten to take bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. So Jesus says, we're going out for a boat ride. We're going to get to the other side of the lake and we're all going to heal the world. We're going to teach you some stuff. Okay, no problems, Jesus. Looking for a whole day of teaching today. Really excited about it. We've got a conference. got ourselves booked in. We're going to be there. And so they get on the boat. They think, my goodness me, I forgot to buy sandwiches. I forgot to bring my, my I forgot to get myself a Tesco's meal deal. We've got, we've got one loaf between 12 big hungry guys. Man, Peter could eat all by himself. And Jesus said, right, teaching time, watch out, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. Now, Jesus often used yeast as an example of bad teaching because once it gets in, it spreads. We've had three families leave our church in Dagnum recently. All of them said the same thing. It's not a community church. We can't serve our community coming to this church. They almost said word for word the same thing. I don't know where that lie came from, but once it gets in, it just goes and infects and gets in people's minds. Beware of the yeast. And they went, oh, he's having a go at us. <laughs> Didn't bring bread. That's another thing that happens a lot. You know, you start preaching, you preach strong. People go, oh, he's having a go at me, isn't he? Oh, he's definitely, oh, man. I, I went and preached in a Brentwood church one evening. And a lady came to me and she went, you caused a fight between me and my husband today. You caused strife between me and my husband today after church in, in Dagenham. I said, I did not. I said, I might have exposed some strife that you have. I said, I didn't cause it. I said, don't try and blame it on me. She said, no, what happened was we got in the car after we came and heard you preaching Dagnum this morning. And my husband turned to me and said, you've been telling Pastor all about me. She said, I haven't told Pastor anything. He went, how could he preach like that if he didn't know all about you? And she said, I know what happened then. You didn't tell Pastor, you told Mrs. Pastor. And then Amanda told Ben, and now Ben knows, and you're just talking about me and gossiping about me. And she didn't tell me anything. But people sometimes think, oh, oh, because you're thinking about the fact that you haven't got bread, you haven't got bread, and then the preacher says, yeast. Oh, he must be talking about me. Come on now, grow up a bit. And he's like, no, I just want to have a conversation about doctrine. He says, why are you having a discussion about bread? Do you not see? Do you not understand? Are your hearts still hardened? You've got eyes and you don't see. You are ears and you can't hear. Don't you remember? Don't you remember? That's one of the hardest things that'll that's one of the things that'll harden your heart more than anything else and soften your heart more than anything else. What you choose to remember. What you choose to remember. My wallet there. I have a new wallet. Why do I have a new wallet? Because I was in America last month and in America I got a prophetic word from Bob Nichols. If you don't know who Bob Nichols is, he helped Gandrew Mac into ministry. He also helped get Kenneth Copeland into ministry. He helped get Jerry Savell into ministry. He's doing quite well helping people get into ministry. And he prophesied over me. And he said about 10 different things. It was a very powerful word. It was a very holy moment. Well, I, I got the first three of those things engraved in my wallet. Do you know why? I'm not forgetting this. I will not forget this. You know, a of times people have come to me recently. Pastors now. Lydia, look fast. I've had pastors come to me. And I'm talking about what we're doing at Tree of Life. And, you know, those of you who know, you know, we've got this vision to start eight new churches. Uh, well, ten new churches, really. We've got Bristol already. We're having monthly meetings there. Man, they've been such powerful meetings. Um, I'm up in Sterling again next week. And then I'm starting Cambridge on November 17th. We're starting Sheffield on February 2nd. Um, we're getting excited about some of these things. Things are happening. And so all these things are happening. And pastor going, oh, I remember God told me to start a second church. When? 1994, I think, maybe, maybe not. You're like, why didn't you do it? How can you harden your heart to the things of God like that? Because you don't remember his goodness. You don't remember what he's like. You remember you forgot the bread. You remember you messed up last time. You remember it was hard work last time. You remember this, you remember that. You've got to start remembering the God stuff. Start remembering he multiplied food. 
When Tree of Life got £3,000 in debt, when we first started Tree of Life in 2010, and it might as well have been £3 million, the amount of people were giving to us. You know, we need three, we need three thousand pounds every day right now, minimum. But back then, three thousand pounds worth of debt. We didn't know how. No one had ever given us hundred pounds before. No one had ever put more than hundred pounds in the offering. And I said, Lord, and I did three things. Some of you might know the three things. One, I wrote a check for a thousand pounds to Tree of Life, and I put it in my bedside cabinet. So every night I went to bed looking at it, someone's going to write me a check for a thousand pounds. And every morning, someone's going to write me a check for a thousand pounds. Second thing I did was I remembered. I wrote down every single gift of money I'd had since I started Bible college, whether someone gave me 10 pounds, 500 pounds, someone paid for this, someone gave me that. I had eight pages of A4, small writing, both sides filled out. Man, I started to remember. It's easy for God to get money. There's so many different ways he can do it. He's so creative. And the third thing I did was I said, what would I do if I was the richest church in the UK? Well, I wouldn't need to keep the offering, would I? So for next week, this whole offering is going to Chris and Vaughn. Next week, this whole offering is going to Caris. Next week, this whole offering is going to World Mission. Fourth week, God said, this is for you, this offering. We took it. It was over £2,000. Not just one, two checks for £1,000. The next week, we had enough. We paid off all the debt, and that was 12 years ago, and Tree of Life has never been in debt since. We need £7,000 by the last day of October, but I'm not even concerned. It's not even raising a sweat anymore because my heart is soft to God. He just does stuff. He just loves to do stuff, but you have to get your heart soft to him. How do you do it? By remembering. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets did you pick up? Twelve. When I broke the seven loaves for 5,000, how many baskets did you pick up? Seven. Do you still not understand? You see, you have to not just remember. You have to understand. You have to think about these things so they make sense to you. God's a good God. God's not going to let you go without your lunch. You know? We have to have a soft heart. It's so important. And do whatever you can to remember. You know, buy the tapes of the meeting. Listen to them again. Get it written down. Get it in front of you. Have it by your side. Put it by your bedside cabinet. Do what you've got to do to remember what God's done for you. I, I talk about meetings I've been at where deaf ears have been opened. And other people go, did that, what? Did that happen in that meeting? How could you forget? Because your heart hardens to natural things very easily. We had a lady. Um, she got very upset with me. Um, she wasn't upset with me. She was upset with her last pastor. And he'd had, had an affair. And uh, she left the church, came to our church. And I prayed for somebody one Sunday. She said, you pray just like my last pastor. You know, I've got two eyes as well. I've got hair. I wear shoes. You know, I mean, pastors pray for people. That's, that's, you know, that's part of the job. And she was so angry. And she said, well, you were praying for somebody to get healed. And I don't believe in healing and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And she was so livid. And I was trying to calm her down. I just couldn't get a handle to calm her down at all. I was trying everything I could do. And uh, Amanda helped, and she was a lot better than I was. And eventually she, she, she left the, the service. Someone else came to me afterwards and said, you know, I was in the church she was in with her when she left. I left just before she left and came here. I said, okay. He said, you see her child? She had a little kid, about four or five, running around. I said, yeah. She goes, that, that boy could barely walk. He was so sick. And he was healed in one of those services. And she's yelling at me, I don't believe in healing. I don't believe God can heal. I don't believe in miracles. I don't believe she pray for the sick. I said, what you're telling me is she's forgotten her own child was healed by Jesus. Yes. And he said, that's exactly what I'm telling you. I said, I, don't think, I didn't think someone could forget that. But you can. If your heart's hard enough, you can get so strong. I mean, what's the difference between that and saying, pray for the frogs tomorrow? No, let's deal with it right now, shall we? You know, it's amazing how many people are happy to spend another night with the frogs in their bed when you could just deal with it before you go to bed. Just a thought. Anyway, so that's my second thing. Have a soft heart. My third thing is it's a done deal. Now, that's not Andrew Ormack phrase. Sorry, that's a, a Dave Duell phrase. It's a done deal. But um, it sums up so much of what Andrew teaches and what's so important for us to make that shift in our minds. Um, Ephesians chapter 1. Let's just find it just after... Um, Galatians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Verse 3, Ephesians 1. Blessed is the God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. You are blessed. You have been blessed. You're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. 
Verse 7 says, In Him we have redemption. We have the forgiveness of sins. These are all things we have. We're not looking to be blessed. We're blessed. We're not looking to get forgiven. We're forgiven. We're not looking to get healed. We're healed. By His stripes, 1 Peter 2.24, you were healed. Past tense. Sorry to turn to an English lesson. But were means it happened. And if you were healed, you was healed. And if you was healed, you is healed. And that's that. Right? By his stripes we were healed. Sometimes when Andrew talks about it, he uses the language of the balance of grace and faith. Grace is what means it's all done. And faith is, I believe it's all done. And if your faith is trying to believe for it to be done, then you don't believe it's been done. Well, I believe I'm going to get my healing. Well, then you don't believe you are healed. You don't believe the Word of God. That takes a while to get your head around sometimes. The truth is you are healed. But I don't look healed. But why are you getting moved by what it looks like? You don't understand? I don't feel healed. Listen, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what it feels like. What does the Bible say? The Bible says you were healed. And that's the truth. I have found if I can get someone to see the by stripes, you were healed. If I can get someone to see they are healed, that they're the, the healed dealing with sickness, not the sick trying to get healed, that is the number one thing that causes their healing to start to manifest quickly. If you can just persuade them understand from the word of God it's a done deal you've already got it to use Andrew's own language there you've already got it it's yours our only job is to tune in I like to use the example of a television how many of you know BBC One's on in this room right now all over this room I mean it's amazing if you <laughs> technology is amazing I always want to imagine explain this to someone who never heard it all their life right now there's invisible beams moving around this room at the speed of light with all the BBC One and BBC Two and ITV and Channel Four programs on them. They're right here in this room. I don't know what's on the telly tonight, I don't care. But you know, let's say the football was on tonight. Well it's here in this room. So when I bring my TV into this room, we don't have to paint a picture of the football. We don't have to get little men to move around. It's here. We just tune in to what's already here. Does that make sense? And it's not about how good I am. It's not about how wonderful I am. It, we just tune in and it's there. And there's not a separate program for you. If I'm sitting in my house watching BBC tonight and you're sitting in your house watching BBC, they haven't made a better program for you than they have for me, is it? We all get the same program. We all get the same thing. We all get the same healing. We all get the same miracle because it all comes from the same cross. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, the program started being broadcast across the whole world. Healing, miracles, salvation, blessings, redemption, wealth, health, prosperity, life in abundance, peace with God. And all you have to do is tune in. And you don't need a TV set to tune in. All you have to do is believe. It's right here. Your healing is in this room. Your healing's been in this room every single day you've come to church. You could come here for a wedding, come here for a funeral, come here for a party. Healing's still in this room. You come here for a wild party, everyone's drunk, everyone's dressed up as Dracula, it's Halloween. But healing power of God's still here in the room. Tune in and you can have it. Just got to tune in, it's a done deal. Well, the more you realize that, the easier everything becomes. My fourth one here is you never lose ground by giving ground. You never lose ground by giving ground. I don't think Andrew's got a book called that. I don't think he's written one. A lot of you know that, um, you know, Greg Fritz is a regular tree of life. He's going to be speaking again at our summer conference, uh, uh, Gates to Sea conference. I've got a venue, by the way, for Gates to Sea. It's going to be at Stansted Airport. So you can fly there if you want. Come go to Heathrow and fly there. <laughs> And so it's at the Radisson Blue in Stansted. There's loads of infrastructure. There's a phenomenal hotel, and it's going to be a great conference. Um, I didn't want to try and cram everybody into Stifford Hall again. I mean, it was standing room only some days last year. So Greg Fritz is coming back for that. We're going to talk about how to lead by listening. So if we can listen to God, we can be more effective leaders. And so I've known Greg for a long time. We're going well. And some of you might have heard my story when I introduced Greg sometimes, that, you know, I joined Andrew Womack's VHS Tape of the Month Club. Yes, I'm that old. VHS Tape of the Month Club, £25 partnership or more, VHS Tape of the Month Club. And this was just after I'd left Bible College. And the first tape they sent me was by Greg Fritz. And I'm like, I didn't join no Greg Fritz Tape of the Month Club. I don't know who Greg Fritz is. I joined Andrew Warmack Tape of the Month. I want to listen to Andrew. What, who's this Greg Fritz fellow? And I put the tape in my bookcase and I never listened to it. 
didn't listen to it. About a year and a half later, Amanda and I were facing a couple of financial challenges. I was struggling to find work, and we'd moved to a town where the, the steel mill had just closed. There was 8,000 unemployed in the town. I'm struggling to find work, and I'm believing God. And Amanda's out one day with the children, and I'm just praying, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to watch this Greg Fritz thing. Let's see if this is, can help me. And I put it on, and it was about living above fear. And it was amazing, and it helped me, and uh, I got a job, and I ended up getting promoted, and it was a big turning point in my life listening to that cassette tape. And so I often share that. When Greg, and Greg spoke to me once about that, and he said, I still don't believe that Andrew did that. He said, I know he did, because other people have told me the same thing. Other pastors invited Greg to preach because they got, Andrew, they got a Greg video too. Now this guy's good, let's get him to preach. He says, it's Andrew's table, let me put himself on it. And you know, Tony Cook said the same thing to me as well. He says, I just stunned at how Andrew just promotes my stuff all the time. Platforms me all the time. You know? But Andrew knows, and he lives it, you don't lose ground by giving ground. Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west or the south, it comes from the Lord. What it is, is a life without selfish ambition. I was part of a small Pentecostal church in Scotland. And uh, some of you have met Graham McClellan, my pastor at the time. He's come and preached at the Tree of Life a couple of times. And um, we were having all sorts of stuff happening. Our doctrine wasn't always exactly what it should be, but our hearts were in the right places. I was with Graham when he prayed for a baby on a machine in the hospital. And we watched the heart rate change as God healed the baby. We watched all the machines change. It was amazing. We'd seen people healed of all sorts of different things. They gave his nephew up for dead and God healed him. And we saw all sorts of wonderful things. And uh, we, were, we were on the streets every Saturday seeing people get saved and healed and delivered. And we had a great time. So I assumed when I left that little church, and went to the denominational Bible college. It was going to be like that, but bigger and better and more fun. And I encountered something that blew my mind. Selfish ambition in ministers. Shouldn't have blown my mind. It's in the Bible. Philippians 1.17 in the NIV says that some preach Christ as selfish ambition. Paul's in jail, and people are using that as an opportunity to build their own ministries. That's amazing. But that's what happens. And I'd seen that, and I was sick of it. I didn't want to be part of that kind of stuff. And I tell you, being in the U.S. Pastors Conference this month, you know, we haven't been there for three years. I've been there about 10 times. Just there's such a lack of selfish ambition there. People just, they rejoice when you're succeeding. You know, if you were failing, they'd, 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 um, they'd rejoice and pray for you and love you. They wouldn't take advantage of you, I believe. I don't know what it's like to be failing, um, so I don't know. But yeah, I'm sure they would be kind to me. But they just rejoice when you rejoice. They're just part of, and it's just a love. There's no other, none of that selfish ambition. There's none of that fighting to get to, to something. It's beautiful. And why is that there? Because it comes down from the head. That's how Andrew treats people. That's how Andrew works with people. That's what he does. That word for selfish ambition there is one of the works of the flesh. It's in Galatians 5. Uh, the King James uses the word disputes. Disputes. And the, the Greek is erytheia. Erythea, and it means to deliberately turn up with a different agenda from everyone else. I'm here to change the way this church should be. And I, I just can't, I couldn't process that when I was at Bible college. I found it so difficult. And I'm so glad we found ministries and spiritual fathers, people like Andrew and people who are close to Andrew, like Greg Moore. You know? And um, it's just wonderful. Just turn to First Peter 5, verse 5. Let me give you this verse. Again, I know this is the kind of attitude I would pick up if I wasn't careful, you know. And I'm so glad I've had so, so many good role models on this. First Peter 5, verse 5, in the same way, you who are su younger, be subject to the elders. And all of you, all of you, clothe yourself with humility toward one another. You know, let, let someone else go first in the line. Let someone else have first place. Bless someone else. Because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And <laughs> I remember having that conversation with Greg Fritz about why would he do that? Why do he promote you? I said, well, Greg, it, it works, doesn't it? It's not Andrew's short of places to minister and get involved, is it? You know, when you start promoting others, when you're not afraid of letting others shine, God will make sure you shine. Whatever you do for someone else, God will do for you. And so I've learned that lesson and I've learned it well. And uh, my last one, and this is probably the most important lesson I've learned from Andrew, number five is don't limit God. 
And so the, 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 the strap line to that book is imagine yourself successful. I read that book every month, by the way. I've read it over 60 times easily, maybe more than that. Numbers 13 verse 33 says we couldn't enter the land because we were grasshoppers in their sight and in our own. Doesn't matter what else sees you as. What do you see yourself as? If you see yourself as a loser, guess what? You're right. If you see yourself as a winner, guess what? You're right. So see yourself as a winner. Psalm 78 verse 41. Andrew didn't write the, the verse. It's in the Psalms. It says they limited the Holy One of Israel. You can limit God. You can actually limit the working of God in your life. Whether it's, oh, frogs can go tomorrow. Oh yeah, just tomorrow. Just another day. As a man thinks in his heart, that's what he is. And again, it goes right back to that first revelation. My spirit's not my soul. Wouldn't it be nice if who I was in my spirit was what manifested every day of my life? Wouldn't that just be awesome? Man, just wealth starts coming towards me. Wise men start opening their treasures and making journeys to my house every day. Man. People giving to me off their substance. Everyone I touch gets healed. My shadow starts healing the sick. But that's not what manifests. What manifests is what's going on in my heart and my soul. So if I think I'm rubbish and useless and, well, I'm just a boy from Essex, how can I be any good? Then that's what I'm going to manifest. But if I start realizing, do you know I'm born again? Do you know I'm one spirit with Jesus Christ? Do you know the same spirit that lives in him lives in me? Do you know I'm anointed? Do you know I'm the salt of the earth? Do you know I'm the light of this world? Do you know that when I lay hands on the sick, they get better? And I start thinking that. As a man thinks in his heart, that's who he is. And your heart, the, word, the Greek word for heart is cardia. And it means the central part of something, the middle part. You know, and so, how many of you know you can have an unhealthy arm and you're still going to be okay? You can have an unhealthy leg and you're still going to be okay. But if your heart's unhealthy, you're in trouble. It comes to the heart of your body I'm talking about here. You know, when I go to the gym, I like lifting weights. I really enjoy lifting weights. But I've got to do my cardio as well. From the Greek cardia, meaning heart. I've got to do my heart workout too. Why? Because that's the one that matters. You know, biceps aren't keeping me alive. Heart's keeping me alive. Now, when it comes to your soul, there is a core of your soul as well. And the core of your soul is your self-identity. Every thought you have, you see, all the blood in my body has to go through my heart. It has to come to my heart and go through my heart. So if my heart's unhealthy, all my blood's going to be unhealthy. Every thought I have has to go through the heart of my soul. And the heart of my soul is this. Who are you? Who am I? And if my self-image is wonky, every thought I have will be wonky. Somebody will be wheeled in a wheelchair and God will tell you, go and pull them out of the wheelchair. And you'll go, I'm not a wheelchair puller out a person. You believe in healing. You believe in miracles. You believe in a God of signs and wonders. You believe it's possible. If I told you some of the stories about people I'd seen pulled out wheelchairs, you wouldn't call me a liar. What don't you believe? You. As you think about yourself, your own self-image is the problem. Does that make sense? We have to work on that. You have to imagine yourself successful. And I've had to fight that because I was raised in such a way, you didn't imagine yourself successful. You know? An ambitious boy in my school was a boy wanting to be a van driver. You know, we had to sit down with them and say, boys from around our way, we don't drive the vans, we load the vans. Man, you don't get ideas too big for your boots. There's something wrong with you. Driving the van, driving the van. <sighs> I had to change the way I thought on every air of my life. I mean, I'm talking about every single air. If I, if I sat there and told you the things I had to change in my mind, you wouldn't believe me. I mean, you, you know when poor people go out and eat? For the, you're going to go out and eat for something, right? Your goal is to find the restaurant that gives you all the food. Right? You want to go to a buffet that says as much as you can eat. Because the goal is quantity. No rich person is going out to find quantity of food. They're looking for a piece of art. 
you know, as Wendell, you, Wendell Parr says, it's all plate and no food, Ben. You know, you can see, he says, take me somewhere you can't see the, the food. You can't see the plate. I don't want to see the plate when I get my food. Do you understand? I want to see the food. I don't want to see the plate. But I had to change my mindset on these things. You've got to change your, your attitude on certain things and different things. How you decorate your house, how you live, how you talk. I deliberately go out and buy th overpriced things just to break the mindset. You know, if you think a, a sum of money is too big, stick it in the offering. And that won't be too big anymore. Oh, it's only that. It's only that much. You know, we, we, we'd make such bad choices. We'd buy 10 pound trainers and have to buy a new pair every year. Found out you could buy a 50 pound pair of trainers in the last 10 years. Save yourself 50 pounds. We didn't realize these things. We don't understand things. Saving. You, you, you mean you put money away and don't spend it as soon as you get it? No, if you, if you don't spend it as soon as you get it, it's going. It's going to go. We don't know where. I always had less in my pockets than I thought. And so I had to change every issue of mindset. And reading that book every month has brought me to that point where I'm not going to be average. And there's a lot of it is Englishisms as well. Some of you heard me last night. Don't be British when it comes to money. You know? We have to not embrace the status quo in this nation when it comes to what church should look like, what church should be, how church should be run. We can't do it like normal. It hasn't got us where we need to go. And what God wants to do in our nation, what God wants to do in the United Kingdom is huge. But we've still got these tiny little dreams. God is talking to everyone in this room and he's giving you ideas on how to pay your mortgage off. Yeah. And I'm not talking about what I don't know. I'm 46 years old and in February next year I have no mortgage. And trust me, it's not because I get paid loads from the church. You can look on the charity return, you can see what I get paid. But I don't live by my salary. I give by my salary and I live by my harvest. We have to stop being average. You know, you're just, oh God, just enough to get me through the month. And he's trying, my me, I'm trying to give you a property portfolio in London. Some of you are like, God, just take the pain away enough for me to be able to come to church today. God's like, I want to take all the pain away. That's amazing how often we limit God. And, and you know, we talk about this, and I can tell you silly stories. We had a. We had a healing meeting once, and a lady came forward for healing, and she had uh, something wrong with her eye. Her eye was huge, and it was touching her glasses. The eyeball was so swollen, it was touching her glasses. And she came forward for prayer, and uh, I was standing there with Richard and Jackie. Hello, Richard and Jackie. Remember this one? And me and Richard kind of maneuvered out the way and let Jackie deal with it, because that's when we, we, let the lady play for the ladies, obviously. So Jackie put her hand over her eye, prayed for her, and she was going, no, 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 no. Sorry. That's not the story. This is what I'm trying to talk about. I'm trying to talk about limiting God. The lady said, could you pray for my foot, please? And me and Richard are like schoolboys standing there. Pray for the foot. Look at the face. Pray for the face. Pray for the eye. And you know, pray for my foot. So Jackie just kneels down, prays for the foot. The foot's healed. And as the lady turns to walk away, Jackie says, can I pray for your eye as well? Oh, I can cope with it. The foot was the sore. Well, just let me. And Jackie prayed, and the eye was healed as well. We watched it. Just you know, it was just a miracle. But amazing how many people just limit God. Just just take away the one worst thing, please. Oh, just enough, Jesus. You know, I I get that sometimes. You know, people want me to do the conferences on the cheap. We did it once. Some of you might have been there. We did it once. We had a heal the nations in Kingsley Hall, and it was just. I, I felt the whole time like I was showering my clothes on. It just wasn't right. We met budget. Praise God, we met budget. That's because the budget was virtually nothing. <laughs> Yay, we met budget. Praise God. But, uh, you know, guest speakers. No, we don't need guest speakers. We'll do it ourselves. We're all exhausted at the end of it. Praise God. You know, I'm trying to make sure people like Victor and Ashley and Richard and you know all our pastors and our team get to sit down and rest some of the services and get fed as well. You know, and it just was amazing that that was a terrible mistake. And people still suggest that to me, you know, oh, you know, let's have it in a budget hotel, let's have it in like, you know, 
People want to have it in Bates Motel or something like that, you know, and just scary and hot. No, we don't want to do that. We want to do what God's called us to do. And we have to not limit God. And I had to, I'll tell you one last thing. I'll be my last story. I promise, my last one. I promise. I had to break this mentality about just enjoying life. First Timothy 6, 17 says, God gives us richly all things to enjoy. So I am, not this trip, but previous trip, four or five years ago, I'm in Alabama, and I'm about to fly home, and I'm going to fly home via <laughs> Chicago, Alabama to Chicago, Chicago to Heathrow. I'm literally landing at Heathrow at 7 a.m. I'm driving to Tree of Life at Sunday morning, and I'm going to preach in Dagnum Sunday morning, okay? It's all set in stones how it's going to be. And um, I'm preaching in this church in Alabama, and I get a text message from my friend Denise Capra. Some of you know Dennis and Denise who have been at True of Life. And Denise says, I can see on Facebook you're preaching in Alabama. I'm in Alabama. I'm about an hour's drive from you. I'm at a meeting. So I told the pastor, I said, my good friend Denise Capra is in Alabama. He said, well, tomorrow night we're not ministering. Let's go to her meeting and let's, let's be there and support her. So we went and uh, Denise prayed with me. And we're driving there to, to this church. And the Holy Spirit speaks to me and he says, Ben, I want you to change your internal flight from Alabama to Chicago and I want you to fly first class. That's what he told me. And I'm like, no, Lord, I shall fly in economy. Don't tell me that. And I just ignored the Lord. My heart was hard. If he told me to swim, I'd have probably swum. <laughs> Honestly, but fly first class for a couple of hours. No, 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 no. And I just ignored the Lord. So we, we hung out and we fellowshiped with Denise, me and the Pastor Mark, Pastor Mark Machen from uh, Life of Faith Church in Alabama. And at the end of it, Denise says, God's given me two words to tell you, Ben. I don't know what they mean, but they might mean something to you. I says, go on. She goes, first class. I was like, okay, Lord. So I told Mark the whole story in the car driving back. I phoned up the airline and I said, I want to travel first class. They said, there's no first class for the transatlantic. I said, I don't want the transatlantic. I want to fly to Chicago first class. Okay, sir, we can do that, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I can't remember how much it cost. It cost £150. $150. $150 to upgrade that flight. So I paid it. So I get to the airport, Alabama, a few days later, Saturday. And my plane is delayed. Quite considerably delayed. And I finally get on the plane. But I'm in first class. I'm actually on seat 1A. That was my seat. The plane lands in Chicago, and literally the gate that I need to get to is directly opposite the plane I'm in. And there's no time at all. We, 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 you know, there's no time at all. But I'm in seat 1A. And because I was first class, when I got off the plane, they'd already brought my bags around to me. And so I grab my bags, and I walk to the gates, and I walk through the gates as they're closing the gates. And I get bored the other plane. I guarantee you, if I'd had to go to the luggage place, it wouldn't have worked. If I was sitting in seat 57C, <laughs> I guarantee you, I would not have got there in time. <laughs> How much money did I save by obeying God? And yet I almost didn't do it because my, my heart was not hard to sacrifice. My heart was hard to being blessed and that's we have to not limit god and a lot of us if we felt god told us something hard and difficult we'd do it but if he told us man it's going to be a success and, and live and be blessed and enjoy and increase we, we, we find it a difficult difficulty we have to really deal with these things and, I, and i'm so glad that andrew's coming it's his first meeting in the uk in years he's coming to tree of life fair what an honor what a privilege. I'm so glad he's come to speak for us and uh, have no doubt I'll learn more. <laughs> no doubt it's going to be a learning experience for all of us. So make sure you're there at the Troxy. Make sure you're there on stream, on stream, on live, live stream audience. You guys, you know who I'm talking about, you. And uh, make sure you're there. We're going to have a great time. Let's just pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Oh, Jesus, somebody's migraine's being healed right now. It's on the right side of your head at the front. You're being healed. Just receive that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for that healing. Father, thank you that you love us, you care for us, you're on our side. And Lord, we pray for this meeting on Sunday, it will go smooth. And there will be such a sense of your presence and godliness. Father, we just pray for Chris and Vaughn right now as they lead worship with all those people. 
I pray that you'd just give them such a wisdom and such a supernatural boldness to lead us into your presence, to praise you, to give thanks to you, to encounter you and your grace. Lord, we pray for Andrew Womack that you'd stretch out your hand and perform signs and wonders through your servant. And I pray for every single guest and new person. Lord, I don't know who the most desperate, weakest person coming to that meeting is, but there must be somebody, Lord, in a worse situation than anyone else. I pray for that person right now that you would lead them to the place where every single need is met, that understand who you are and walk in victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Back to you, Victor. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs>